All right, let's look at the placental mammals. So we have this video and then one more looking at the different groups of placental mammals. So we're still in chapter 18, um, looking at the endothermic vertebrates, the warm-blooded animals. And then in particular here, part B of this chapter, the mammals. And last time we kind of looked at the overview of the mammals, as well as a little bit closer look at the placental mammals. I'm sorry, not the placental, the monotremes and the marsupials. And then here we're taking a closer look at the placental mammals. And we just kind of look at this group by group and um, yep, we'll see what pops up. So the first order, so we're in family, well, so kingdom, phylum, class, family order. Uh, class mammalia, and I, I didn't really get into the King Philip came over. No, no, no. Class order, and then family. Yeah. So I, I usually don't look at the specific families within these, but anyway. All right. So order, rodentia. These are the gnawing mammals. Uh, the, this is the largest order of mammals with about 1,800 species. And these are things like mice, squirrels, porcupines, which I usually wouldn't think of mice and porcupines as being in the same group, but they have the, the, the you know, characteristics that put them best together rather than in any other group. And beavers, prairie dogs, kangaroos, rats, maras, we'll see a picture of that if, if you're not familiar with it, and groundhogs. And speaking of groundhogs, let's do video question number one. Well, number one is actually first this time. Question number one is, what's another name for a groundhog? And the answer is woodchuck. Uh, I do think it's kind of interesting that, you know, there's like the woodchuck, how much chuck could a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck could chuck wood? You can do the same thing with a groundhog. How much ground could a groundhog hog if a groundhog could hog ground? So there you go. So next February 2nd, if anyone is saying happy groundhog day, you can say, and happy woodchuck day to you. Yeah, so video question number one, another name for a groundhog is a woodchuck. The uh, main characteristic of these is their large chisel-like incisors in upper and lower jaws. This is used for that. Everything from e eating wood to, you know, um, like, as in like the beavers gnawing on wood, uh, gnawing on a wide variety of things. Their incisors actually keep growing their whole lives, and so your average... Your average uh, rodent, if it didn't keep gnawing on stuff throughout its life, its its incisors would get too long, and it it you know just wouldn't work. All right, except for the porcupine, most of these are defenseless. So how do they survive? Well, basically they reproduce a lot. So in particular, uh, field mice. An average field mice can be weaned at three weeks old be living independently at four weeks old, and then can bear a litter of 13 to 16 offspring at six weeks old, and then repeat that cycle. So it's like every six weeks, you can have approximately a dozen more. Six weeks, another, well, it's like not a dozen more because each, well, males versus females. So let's just say on average, every six weeks, you are multiplying by about six times as many kind of how that math can work out. Crazy exponential growth if there's enough space and there's enough resources and everything like that, but that's why mice infestations can happen all of a sudden real quick. And some of these rodents, so oops, oh, I forgot to change this. So what happened was I decided it made more sense to start at the left and then to go around to the right, and so I rearranged these but I forgot to rearrange the uh, the title here. So it still says clockwise starting upper right, but it's actually starting at the left. This is a kangaroo rat, which is actually pretty cute. Um, a lot of people really don't care for rats, although the occasional person who likes to have a rat as a pet, I've known a few of those. Kind of funny that a lot of people like to have hamsters for pets, but not rats, but anatomically, they're super similar to each other. Mainly hamsters are furrier and don't have the big tail that a rat has. But this one is a kangaroo rat. There's something kind of similar to it called a jerboa, and we'll look at a video about that in just a second. This is the Patagonian Mara. It is the third largest rodent, but it's like it's kind of like the hind legs of this kangaroo rat, 
It's like slightly kangaroo-like in his hind legs, a little bit in his, and even in the shape of his head, everything, but it's a rodent. And then we have some prairie dogs. I always enjoy seeing prairie dogs at the, at the zoo. Uh, this is a beaver dam. And beavers build dams mainly for two reasons. So when they build the dam, it backs up the water and it keeps this from being as, as much like a flowing river and usually creates some kind of little pond or lake. And there are two things that that does. Thing number one is it creates a larger body of water and beavers are really good swimmers and most things that want to hunt beavers are not quite as good at swimming. So by creating the dam and creating this uh, pond or lake, the beaver has created a, uh, a location for it to live where it's easier for it to escape from the animals that would want to kill it. But then also creating this still water, uh, it induces plants, different types of aquatic plants to grow. That is the type of plant that beavers like to eat. Anyways, so that's that. This is a capybara. This is the largest kind of rodent. And uh, yeah, they can get to be, uh, an adult capybara can be four and a half feet long and can weigh upwards of 150 pounds. And uh, I always enjoy seeing those at the zoo. Oftentimes, I don't get to see them at the zoo very well because they're just not out and about a whole lot. But when you do, do get it, it's like, dude, that is a huge rodent. That is an R-O-U-S, a rodent of unusual size. And that relates to video question number five. Number five, what is the largest rodent? And the answer is capybara. And I have it spelled for you right there, capybara. The largest rodent. Video question number five. And then a porcupine. Video. The jerboa you can sort of think of as a furry little rodent version of a Tyrannosaurus rex. They're about the size of a large mouse. They have these really strikingly large eyes. They have forelimbs which people sometimes overlook because they're tucked up underneath their jaw. The hind limbs are really, really long and dramatically different. They are capable of jumping three feet straight up in the air. They're very springy. And because of this tail that they have, which is also really, really long, the Kazakh people living in northern China call them Loming Tuk Tuk, which is translated to noodle hop hop. Of the many unique features of the jerboa, it's their hind limbs that are perhaps the most intriguing. What looks like a backwards turned knee is actually their ankle. And that long bone stretching down from the joint isn't their shin. It's their foot, and what you might think is their feet is actually their toes. This unique morphology is quite a departure from their ancestor, the common mouse. The mouse has what we call the ancestral body form of arms and legs that are the same length. The jerboa has taken that basic body plan and has modified it extremely to have long legs and long feet. What we really hope to understand is how do you get skeletal elements, bones, that reach different lengths in a body. Do the bones grow faster? Do they get longer because they grow for a longer amount of time in development? To answer these questions, simply take a skeletal element from a recently deceased jerboa and embed it in a small block of ice. Using a cryostat, which is basically a very high-tech deli slicer, shave off a tiny portion and place it onto a slide. Use a series of special dyes to stain the bone elements. Alizarin stains the bone red, while Alshin stains the cartilage blue, making each easier to identify and study. Then pop the slide under a microscope and observe. The cells in the cartilage are called hypertrophic chondrocytes. Hyper is, is fast, elevated, trophic is growth. And they're chondrocytes, which is the cell type that makes up cartilage, so a hypertrophic chondrocyte is a cartilage cell that gets very, very big, very, very fast. 
The faster growing bones in the jerboa have larger cartilage cells, and that much we knew. But what we realized early on was that we didn't even know how these cells were getting bigger to begin with. Animal cells typically enlarge by making stuff. Proteins, fats, and complex sugars. And also by taking up water to keep the concentration of that stuff constant. If the water content of most cells increases by 10%, the cell runs the risk of rupturing. Cartilage cells, however, can increase their water volume by a staggering 60%, blowing up like water balloons. This lets them grow bigger faster since it takes less energy and time to suck up water than it does to make more stuff. The purpose of those cells is to lay the foundation, the scaffolding structure around them. Then those cells die, and then bone cells come in and they remodel all of that. So the major purpose of that cell is just to get really big, really fast, and make a scaffold. It's like building a building. So now that we've answered this question about how cells get big, we can circle back around to our original question, which was how that growth is controlled so that cells reach different sizes. If we can understand the mechanics of how a bone grows, then we can begin to understand how to manipulate that growth. That kind of knowledge can prove useful when treating bone deficiencies and asymmetries in people. Treating bone disease was not something that Kim Cooper set out to take on, but instead was the result of asking the right series of questions. It's not an either or that we should study human disease or we should study weird animals. To me, I think one of the most important things about what we're doing is that it helps us to understand how all bodies work, ours included. We're all built basically the same way. If we can understand the mechanisms that allow the jerboa to develop their hind limbs, those are probably the same fundamental principles that shape our bodies. With my own little one growing and shaping inside of me, it gives me great comfort just understanding these processes, knowing how remarkable it is when everything goes well. For Science Friday, I'm Christian Baker. So that's the jerboa. Uh, a three-foot jump for the size that it is would be the equivalent of a person jumping on top of, you know, from the ground up to the top of a five- or six-story building. <laughs> it's what that would be like. Yeah, that'd be crazy. Uh, this next one is a porcupine and the sounds that he makes are so cute. It's in your basket. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. cute, but you get enough of the idea, so I'm going to move on. Uh, the next order, so that was order Rodentia. This is order Carnivora, also known as the meat-eating animals. That's the main characteristic. You know, they get their food in a variety of ways, whether some of them mainly by stealth, you know, such as the, the cats, uh, by cooperation, uh, such as a lot of the, the dog type. Um, yeah, anyway, so approximately 280 species here, and uh, this is a little bit more detailed than what your textbook has, but I think some of this is pretty interesting. Uh, order Canidae, you know, the, the really the, the canines, right? So here we have dogs, wolves, and foxes are the main examples of what we have here. Uh, family Ursidae, the bears, and there are, what, I think nine different species of bear. 
Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, eight species of bear. There's the brown bear, the American black bear, the polar bear, the giant panda, the Asian black bear, the sun bear, the sloth bear, and the spectacled bear. And I have a picture of a couple of those on the next slide. Then family uh, Eluridae and the red panda is the only species there. Red pandas are kind of their own unique. They're called red pandas, but they're not pandas. Some people call them like red bears, but they're not bears. They're just their own unique things. They kind of look like a raccoon, but they're not raccoons either. Yeah. Uh, family Procyonidae, uh, Procyonidae, the raccoons, the kinkajous. I have a picture of a kinkajou on the next slide. And the ringtails. And then family Mustelidae, the skunks, badgers, wolverines, otters, and weevil, sorry, weasels. And then family Viveridae, the mongooses and civets. And then family Hyenidae, the hyenas. So let's look at some of these that you probably don't recognize quite as well. And the same thing as the other one that should say clockwise starting at upper left. Here we have a red panda. That one's actually the Sacramento Zoo. I, I took that picture as he was dozing on a log there in, in the Sacramento Zoo. So you can see the, the, the facial markings, and you can't quite see the tail, but it has a ringed tail, and the facial markings will look kind of like a raccoon, but then certain aspects of his body kind of look like a panda, but then, yeah, anyway, but they're their own unique things. This is a kinkajou. Uh, I have a video where you'll see a little bit more about a kinkajou. And a wolverine... And these things can be pretty fierce. Uh, check out the claws, which in some pictures is even way more pronounced looking of claws. And I think you might get an idea of why the X-Men Wolverine is called Wolverine. And the African civet, all again, kind of raccoon looking in its head, which the civet uh, is, I'm trying to remember. Oh yeah, it's not in the same group as raccoons. That's right. Uh, it's in the same group as mongooses. Okay. And then this is a sloth bear and then a weasel. Okay. Hey, everybody. Oh, <laughs> today we're working with a kinkachu, and I've never seen one of these before. This is going to be such a cool challenge. Welcome to the party. Ooh, there's two. Come on. Whoa. We're in the chimp forest, and I'm with Julie and Sarah, and today we're gonna to be working with Kayla the Kinkachu. She's typically used to working on flat, tall surfaces, like a table, but today we're gonna to be working with her on this surface, which is a little bit different for her. Normally, we take her to school programs, and she is on a table, like you said. Okay, cool. So should we pull her out? Yeah, it might take a second to wake her up because they are nocturnal. I know, I have oh. your favorite food. Grapes. Hi. Um, so I can give you a grape too. Okay. Should I get her? I might have to hide this bag before she grabs it because she will go for the whole thing. <gasps> uh, yes. That's so, so cool. Sure I'm freaking like out. This is so cool. I'm sorry. <laughs> You're doing a great job. Not everyone gets the animal just climbing all over. I them. just definitely did that purposely. Yes. She's like really totally comfortable with me. Yeah, she says you have great. She gonna bite my face? I mean, we have a good saying at the zoo that anything with a mouth can bite. <laughs> um, but I would not guess based on her behavior that she is going to bite you right she now. She kind of looks like a monkey. She does, and that is because there would be a lot of monkeys that live in her habitat. Um, so she has to have the same adaptations that they would have. Um, she has to have a prehensile tail to grab onto all the branches that she would be encountering in the trees. Can you explain a little bit more, like, what's a prehensile tail? Um, so a prehensile tail is um, basically a tail, but unlike a lot of animals, the tail can actually grab onto things. So it has muscles and, or and it can cling to things. So um, animals like Kayla have this very long tail, and she can actually kind of hang from a branch and hold her whole body weight on it. So it's really like a limb. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's so cool. So how old is Kayla? Kayla is actually fairly old. Um, she is 25, um, wow. and 
In captivity, they can live from like 25 to 30, um, and the oldest was actually around 39. You go back to your kennel. Okay, so she ran off for a second, but we got her back. She got my thumb. Yeah, We're holding hands. Yeah. She's so cool. Hi, baby. What's going on? Hope you guys had fun with us today. If you want to watch more videos like this, click here. And don't forget to subscribe below. In a lot of ways, it seems kind of similar to a primate with like the way it uses tail, some of the ways that it moves, but it best fits in the carnivorous section. Why honey badgers so fearless? Today, I found out the world's most fearless creature is the honey badger, according to the Guinness Book of World Records. Honey badgers have many reasons to be fearless. They have very thick, rubbery skin, which is so tough that it's been shown to be nearly impervious to traditionally made arrows and spears. Further, their skin can take a full blow from a sharp machete without necessarily cutting the skin all the way through. More practically, this skin helps protect the honey badger from the teeth of predators. Along with being thick and very tough, the honey badger's skin is also fairly loose, which allows it quite a bit of freedom of movement within the skin. This particularly aids it when it's being attacked by large predators and finds itself in the predator's clutches. It can then squirm about in its skin and get its long claws and mouth with sharp teeth in such a position to harm the predator that is holding it. Along with sharp teeth, honey badgers also have incredibly powerful jaws. This is helpful due to the fact that the honey badger will eat every part of its prey, including the bones. The jaws are even powerful enough to eat a turtle, including the shell, without difficulty. Not only this, but they are naturally not very affected by many types of stings and venom. They can even get bitten by king cobras and puff adders multiple times with little effect, though a strike from something like a puff adder that manages to actually penetrate their skin will eventually knock the honey badger out for a couple of hours. Although it is not known exactly how the honey badger's body resists the effects of these types of deadly venom, it is thought that if the snakes could strike them enough, it's likely the venom would eventually kill the honey badger. Along with its innate toughness, the honey badger is also incredibly intelligent. It has even been observed using tools to catch prey. They also are smart enough to follow honey guide birds to find beehives where they'll eat the larvae and honey. Interestingly, the honey badger also has a reversible anal pouch, which has an incredibly strong, stifling odor. They've been observed to use this stench as an additional form of defense against large predators like lions. This combination of remarkable innate defensive and offensive capabilities has resulted in the honey badger seemingly fearing few things. Their aggressiveness has also resulted in few predators, which normally might try to eat something the honey badger's size, choosing to avoid the animal. Even predators such as lions and leopards tend to give the honey badger a large berth, though honey badgers have been known to be killed by lions and leopards. That's all for today. Thank you so much for watching, and please don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell button. And this one with some pandas, namely a mother panda playing with the baby.
がってますよ。<笑>そう、ちょっと少しずつ、そのグループ、その、カーニバーズ、そのファミリー、フィーラデイ、and these are the cats、and such a huge variety of animals here。レパーズ、タイガーズ、ライオンズ、ジャグワイアーズ、アカラッツ、サーヴォーズ、サザンタイグリーナーズ、ボブカッツ、リンクス、チーダーズ、アンクーガーズ、と名前を言う。あ、レッツ、シー、メンション、プーマー、デー、デー、デー、デー、デー、デー、デー、デー、Okay, well, I can still do video question number three. So, puma is another type of, of feline carnivore. And video question number three says A puma with an entire deer in its mouth was once seen jumping onto a branch how high off the ground? And the answer is 12 feet. 12 feet off the ground. This puma, and puma is considered in the group of these small cats. It's the, the biggest of these small cats. And yeah, with an entire deer in its mouth, it jumped up onto a branch that was 12 feet off the ground.、Uh, and then we have suborder Pinnipedia. Now, your textbook lists this as its own separate order, separate from carnivores, but a little bit more commonly, The pinnipeds are considered within the carnivore group because of their meat eating、um, characteristic. And there are about 30 species here. And what we have is we have a family that has the eared seals, family that has walruses, and then a family that has the earless seals. And, and you'll see what I mean in just a second by the eared seals versus the earless seals on this next page, I think. Yep. And again, clockwise starting left. All right, so this is a southern tigrina. They, they really look kind of、uh, sleek and pretty cute sometimes. And then this is a serval, known for their big but rounded ears. And then this is a lynx. Check out those eyes, too. And I like that, the kind of like beard ish thing. But then they're known for these pointy things that stick out from their ears. And some walruses. And then. An earless seal. See that little slit there? That's where his ear is versus an eared seal. That's his ear right there. So with ears, without ears. Okay. Every feature of the cheetah says speed. Are like weight. A long, flexible spine spring loads each stride, which can cover almost 30 feet in a quarter second. <laughs> On the flat track of Africa's plains, it's pure afterburner. Claws never retract, delivering more traction in high speed turns. To sustain this incredible speed, the cheetah sucks in oxygen through oversized intake valves, large nasal passages. Its lungs, liver, heart, and adrenal glands are supersized to kick its metabolism into high gear. Its tail acts as a rudder for high speed turns. Even over the scrubby terrain of the Mala Mala Game Reserve, the cheetah's speed equals almost instant death.
So cheetahs hold the record for the fastest land animals, the fastest you know animal to be able to run on land. Uh, well, speeds in excess of 60 miles an hour. That puts them at roughly three times as fast as Usain Bolt's top speed, just to <laughs> give you a little bit of perspective there. We have two orphaned walrus that uh, were rescued in near Barrow on the north slope of Alaska and came to the Alaska Sea Life Center in July. And somehow they got separated from their mothers and with walrus they normally spend two years with their mothers. Um, but both of these animals without their mothers are, are in a unique situation where um, we're always cautiously optimistic about their health. Walrus require 24-7 care. Originally, we had four people around the clock working with these walrus. Um, right now, it's at least two at all times. They're bottle fed every four hours. We are providing them access to a pool um, several times a day so that they can go swimming. They're very social, tactile animals, so um, sometimes the two animals will provide that to each other and sleep, even one on top of the other almost. Uh, sometimes they want to curl up to one of their human caregivers. There are always people around. Um, they don't want to be left alone. It's been amazing. With Midic, we kept running into new or evolving problems for two weeks. It it seemed like every other day there was something new to address and it was getting a little disheartening, especially when he wasn't nursing from a bottle. You know, slowly things started improving and it was just phenomenal when he started nursing on the bottle. I've had a number of occasions to come in and, and just give him a bottle and it, it's a great feeling having them come to you and drink from a bottle and you know it's a very positive experience for, for people taking care of them because they definitely pay attention to you and follow you around and you know seem to enjoy having you around and that's, that's, that's nice. There's a lot of coastline in Alaska where there aren't a lot of people. Um, so these animals were lucky that they were, they were found by those um, residents of Barrow. Otherwise, they would have never been found, and they probably, uh, they probably would have starved because without their mothers, they wouldn't have had a food source. Our staff pretty much knew from day one that they were going to be non-releasable. Um, Pakak, the larger animal, is going to the Indianapolis Zoo, and Midic, the smaller one, is going to the New York Aquarium. So those are some younger um, walruses, and this next video is an older one that's been trained to make all sorts of different kinds of sounds. Well, I mean, sounds that he naturally could make, but what I mean by trained to make all sorts of different kinds of sounds is trained to do different sounds that he naturally can make, but at given commands. <laughs> That whistle was impressive. Uh, next, we have Order of Cetacea, the marine mammals. Now, you might think, well, aren't, aren't like seals and walruses marine? Well, yes, but seals and walruses regularly come up to land. And whereas these, the Order of Cetacea, they just live in the water. And approximately 100 species of these, and these are characterized by dorsal blowholes, so a hole that they um, get rid of some of their air in the back of their head, and horizontal flukes or tail fins. And I mentioned when we were talking about fish, so that's one of the main ways that you can tell the mammals from the fish, is the tail fin of a fish is vertical, whereas the tail fin of a mammal is uh, horizontal. And then echolocation is a common characteristic as well. And we have things here like blue whales, fin whales, dolphins, killer whales, and humpback whales. And here we have some of the different, these are the different dolphins and uh, quite a few different types of dolphin. And then this is a picture of a dolphin that I took on my honeymoon in Hawaii. 
And yeah, so we were we were over by Kona, and um, there's a, a little bay there. We were in some kayaks, and we were kayaking across it. And there's this dolphin in particular. You can see a few other dolphins that were in the area, but this one in particular was just looking for opportunities to show off. And so you'd find mainly some of the smaller boats in the area. You'd go over by those and jump up out of, out of the water and then down, and just like he just apparently some of these dolphins enjoy getting the attention that people give them. And so I, I put it here partially to see if you could identify what species, uh, or at least what type of dolphin it is. And I'll give you a second to look and make a guess. And it is this one over here, the short-snouted spinner dolphin. Spinner dolphin is the most common common type of dolphin in that area of Hawaii. And um, yeah, it has this like lighter color there that you can see there. And then notice the shape of the dorsal fin, shape of the dorsal fin. And so if, if you're uncertain about whether or not it's the, the short-snouted spinner dolphin or the long-snouted spinner dolphin, look at the long-snouted spinner dolphin. Its fin is a different shape than that one. Yep, so there you go. And then next we have some of the different whale types and the blue whale it holds the record for being the largest mammal, uh, the largest animal period. The blue whale thing can be huge. I mean, here's an elephant for reference. Here's a person for reference. So blue whale, fin whale, um, white, the right whale, the bowhead whale, uh, humpback whale, those are a little more well-known. Sperm whale, think like Moby Dick. Narwhal, I have a, little, a couple pictures of narwhals here in a second. The killer whales are orcas, and then you have some of the dolphins and porpoises here. Porpoise, I won't get into the difference between porpoise and dolphin, but yep. All right, this is a narwhal. Um, also known sometimes, not too surprisingly, as the unicorn of the sea. And I have a video question about these things. This is video question number four. Number four. The narwhal's tusk is actually a what? And the answer is a tooth. The narwhal's tusk is actually a tooth. It's actually its upper tooth. And just kind of where it comes out and where it attaches to, uh, yeah, it's where it attaches. It is a single, super long, these can get to be around 10 to 12 feet long uh, tooth. Uh, I think about 10 feet long usually. And they use them a little bit for, like, stabbing or uh, attacking their prey. And, yeah, so that's a narwhal. Mainly they live in the Arctic regions. Oh, I thought I had... Hold on a second. What happened to my... Oh, that's right. Okay, next I must have a video. Yes? The first time I saw this was probably three months ago. I walked down here with uh, a guest, a VIP guest, and we were watching. It's kind of a cool behavior that the dolphins kind of learn from one another. We got word that the dolphins at the Dolphin Cove here at SeaWorld were doing this really cool behavior at the underwater viewing windows where they were blowing bubbles out of their blowhole. When the dolphins are making their bubble rings, it looks as though they're blowing a big puff of air out of their blowhole. They angle their heads so that it comes up perfectly straight to create the ring. It's amazing how they can, can uh, emit this ring of air from their blowhole. I caught myself going to the glass and just sitting and staring. I couldn't even talk. It was one of those things, don't bother me right now. I'm watching the most incredible thing I've ever seen. If you had a balloon at home and you flex and you play with the end of it to make the different sounds, they can do that with their blowhole. It kind of just looks like a little halo at first and then they just push it and it gets smaller. Either take their rostrum or their head and kind of move it in a circle to make it bigger. They blow the bubble and then the other one wants to get to it and it's the smaller it gets and then he's like, all right, I'm gonna pop it, it's my toy. You can't have fun with that one. That's, you know, that's mine. If you wanna do it, make your own, you know? Logic would tell you that when you have air underwater, it immediately starts to rise. These rings are in a cylindrical form and they're perfectly circled and they're traveling down. We mostly see the females doing it for some reason. My guess would be that maybe the males are preoccupied with the social interaction with each other. 
seems to be very entertaining for the Dolphins. It's really interesting for us to watch, and uh, the guests really just think it's something cool. It didn't really look like it was a bubble. It just it looked like it was a dark, solid color, yeah. and like a snake, and you couldn't really see the bottom part of it. Several years ago, there may have only been one or two that have done it, so it seems that either other animals are catching on or they're being taught how to do this. And this is just not blowing out a bubble of air. This is, they've had to watch and learn the process and the technique of being able to take this bubble ring and to hold it underwater, to spin it, and to really manipulate it. I really hand it to these animals just how, how quickly they learn something as complicated as that. As you saw with the bubble ring, it kind of created a little bit of attention from the other animal and kind of was like, hey, wait a minute, what, what, what was that? How did you do that? That may be an animal that may not necessarily know the bubble ring yet. And again, it just kind of piqued his interest. Down here, it's one of the best places to watch dolphins because what you're seeing is their natural behavior. As long as we've been doing this, the 30 plus years that SeaWorld has had these animals, we're still learning from them, just as they're learning from us. Just when you think you've seen it all or you've learned it all, uh, something new comes up. Something you gotta see to see how amazing it really is. It was one of those moments in life where you went, we haven't figured all, all the things out yet. These animals have a lot more to teach us. Yeah, dolphins exhibit all sorts of just crazy amounts of intelligence. And then... Lastly, we have Order Sirenia, also known as the sea cows. And it's another thing where it might seem like they're kind of similar to the pinnipeds, you know, the seals, sea lions, walruses. But again, these don't come out of the water. And uh, yeah, so two main, well, actually two types of things here. Are, I'm trying to remember if there are others, but manatees and dugongs. And it's a manatee on the left and then a dugong on the right. And here we get video question number two. Video question number two. Stories of what mythological creatures or creature probably arose from sailors seeing manatees? So as it goes, apparently sailors saw manatees and they made up some stories and they were making up stories about mermaids. So the answer to number two is mermaids. And uh, it's not super flattering for mermaids to say that uh, apparently they're based on manatees, but that's how it goes, apparently. Anyway, so that's the kind of first half of taking a closer look at the placental mammals, and then we'll get stuff, um, you know, well, anyway, I'll, I'll leave it for next time for you to see what we get. But that does it. Have a good one.